to season 12 of The Cinematologist. This is our new theme tune. So that was our new theme tune, courtesy of Gwenho. Dario, what do you think? Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. We were thinking about a change again to various things, and the theme tune was one. And uh, amazingly, we have gotten this opportunity through yourself for uh, contacting uh, the musician, which we both love, Gwenho, who uh, has agreed. So how did this all come about? Just as you said, really, yeah, we were kind of chatting. Um, we wanted something yeah, something new. And, and Gwen had made an appearance on episode 100 and we knew that she was yeah, a fan of the show and sort of become a friend through Mark Jenkin and yeah, just wanted to see if she'd be up for it. So just sent one of those kind of speculative emails. Hey, how you doing? Do you fancy writing a theme tune for our podcast? And yeah, she said yes. And we've been working with Heavenly and Downtown Publishing and Fiona, Gwen's manager. And yeah, it turned up the other day and what a piece of music it is absolutely kind of yeah spellbinding i think yeah i mean it's always interesting isn't it when you ask somebody to produce something and you're like i wonder what's going to turn up am i going to like it and yeah it's it ties in i think a lot with uh our enjoyment of gweno's music anyway as as having both a feeling i think that this, this one is definitely sort of 80s electronica inspired but also has that cinematic texture that we like so yeah really fantastic like you say yeah kind of instinctively think that she gets what we do and what we would like um and also obviously we like her for those kind of reasons that you've sort of said and yeah when i heard it i thought this is this is spot on um recalls she sort of says she's going for a kind of 1980s channel 4 vibe which we talk a lot about you know those kind of shows that that sort of turned us on to film on the bbc and channel 4 in terms of with those kind of classic theme tunes and yeah it was just just fantastic to hear it and feel like yeah this is this is the show, the ebb and the flow in the song, to me, feels like what we try and go for, you know, in terms of how we kind of move through a show with our different themes and tones. And yeah, just an absolute honour to to have such a kind of special piece of music recorded for the show. So yeah, huge, huge thanks to to Gweno for, for doing it and um, hope uh, our listeners, listeners liked it. Absolutely. So on with the show. How you doing, mate? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm okay. I'm trying to deal with the the beginning of term. I mean, anybody who listens who's uh, an academic and is going through the same process is probably juggling, you know, about 25 balls and and dropping a few of them and trying to pick them back up again. Our next episode is going to cover a lot of that and we'll probably trail that towards the end of the uh, the end of the podcast more fully, but it is about what is going on in terms of film education, how are we feeling about it, how are students feeling about it. So it's sort of aimed at that that audience. But I don't know how you've felt about the summer, but there's been a lot of introspection from me, kind of not necessarily that I've sat down and thought, okay, what's you know, what's going on in the world? What's going on with me? It's just been a natural offshoot, I think, of the circumstances. The beginning of lockdown was weirdly interesting i thought you know what i mean i don't know how you felt about it but then you know as time goes on having to deal with the changes in very very quick time and a lot of admin and the pushing back of loads of deadlines and all the situations that people will have been experiencing who are doing homework i mean i understand that there's a a huge proportion of people who are who worked all the way through on the on the front line as it were and yeah a little bit of a break in the summer but again i've been thinking a lot about my role as an academic, my relationship to cinema, my relationship to kind of art and culture and politics, the whole shebang. How do I want to engage with it going forward? Because I'm I'm not happy with the way that the milieu in which I operate is, I feel like is controlled in, in ways that I'm not satisfied with, but it's it's finding a kind of answer to that that continues to be difficult. Have you found anything so far? Where, where are you at the minute with that? Well, again... There is a sort of sense in which I'm accepting of the fact that that the university life is a job and my life sort of separates out into three parts rather than two parts because, you know, we talk about home life balance a lot. A lot of people talk about that dynamic 
and how to get that right. But I kind of have it in three ways. So there's the university work has become much more work and much more admin and much more dealing with problems and much less about research or scholarly motivation or interest you know stuff that fires the stall that that's where i get that's where i come here for in yeah. many ways and and even the even the research work that i do that is academic and you know would be part of my career progression let's say i'm trying to think about that less as doing it for career progression reasons and doing it more for self satisfaction altruistic um feeding the soul type reasons and then having a kind of trying to manifest areas of my life that are very much switch off entirely yeah. and refresh and even even just sort of not doing anything you know not feeling bad you know sitting on the settee for 5 minutes and not thinking oh i need to be on social media or i need to be on email that kind yeah. of thing is is something that i'm i'm trying to structure into the way that I think about my my working day especially being at home all the time and then we'll get on to cinema I think you know in the next episode I don't want to sort of go up down that road on this particular on this episode interesting and yeah you? I think yeah yes similar I think you know definitely been a period of of reflection and and kind of change uh, from where I was at the start of the year feeling very had a nice I had a message just after the last or towards the end of the last um season you know saying that we we sounded stressed you know and i think that 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 kind of period of just before lockdown and then going to lockdown was was stressful for so many people and definitely one of the things i wanted to do was was come out the other side feeling like i'd address some of the underlying reasons why that might be the case and and how to how to deal with them and I, i'm feeling very confident going into the the new term you know and very similarly reconfigured and, and sort of repositioned where I where I fall on a lot of the things that you're talking about there in terms of work and life and, and culture and stuff and uh, yeah, I mean I put I put a lot of it into a film that I made this summer which was which yeah was, I saw that I know, really enjoyed that I wish I'd, I, I wish I'd have you know got my finger up I was still in the middle of admin but it was yeah really nice to see thank you yeah and it was just one of those things like the opportunity came up and I thought why not you know and I did a lot of that which I'm feeling good about so that hopefully gonna that's going to carry through the next few weeks which are undoubtedly going to be with many challenges. But I, I feel better than I did at the start of the year, you know, um, in many ways, as, as difficult as, as it's been and as difficult as it's going to get, I do feel like it's been a good year of... Uh... It's funny, someone messaged me the other day saying, is this the year, I think it's Scott who listens to the podcast, said, is this the year that uh, I say that it's been a bad year for cinema? And in many ways, yeah, it's been an absolutely awful year for cinema mm. um, as, a, as an industry. And... The films that have been released are are not necessarily all the, the, the normal films that I would have had in a kind of best of list at this time. But I just couldn't do it, you know. I'm just I am a I am an optimist. Um, I kind of dug into what I'd seen this year and a lot of short film stuff as well. But but wanted to say no, actually, you know. And I, I, that's to do with me, you know. I think that's just to do with I don't want to be like it's it's all rubbish and it's all doom and gloom, you know. And I certainly can't I can't teach like that, you know. Right. I, I I can't, you know, whether it's a uh, smoke screen or, or whatever I, I i need to feel like there's positivity in there in order in order to be able to to go in and do the work so yeah that's that that was my summer in terms of the watching it's it's funny because I, I did have a period in the summer where i was completely just re-watching stuff it was like i don't you know what i mean i just need to sort of escape to something that i know when i sit down to watch it i don't have to think about do i like this do i not like this I'm watching it because it's there and, I, and I, I know it already. It was what was really nice actually was I sat down and watched a lot of the 80s and 90s erotic thrillers that are covered on the Fatal Attractions pod. And it was just really nice sort of watching some of those, some good, some mediocre, some terrible, but then getting that conversation. And it was, you know, sometimes when it, when I, I feel the reasons that people listen to this podcast as much as the, you know, the the direct content in terms of, you know, interviews and and, and what have you. It was just nice to drop in on four people who have a dynamic and listen to them talking about it and and see where what I thought about the film how it how it lays with what they're saying about it and of course hopefully in the coming season we'll we're hoping to have those guys on the podcast in a kind of fatal attraction cinematologist showdown no I'm not going to put it in adversarial terms it's going to be uh, good fun to to talk to them about how they put their show together among lots of other stuff we've got coming up yeah it's a uh, an, another big season lots of really exciting guests and episodes in the pipeline 
Yes, we have a major coup for the podcast uh, on today's episode, which is about the the documentary, The Great Buster, uh, which is about Buster Keaton. And although it's not Buster Keaton, um, it is nearly as good as that. So, Dario, who have we got on the podcast today? So, yes, we spoke to Peter Bogdanovich, amazingly enough. And, uh, yeah, it, it, this came about earlier on in the year when the film was slated to be released in cinemas around the lockdown time and of course that didn't happen and we got a, an email from Tom Finney from Blue Dolphin Films which I think is the UK distribution arm yep, of the right, uh, yeah. of the film and it was kind of like an invite to one of the screenings in which Paul Merton was hosting a, a, a sort of intro and Q&A and it was literally that I was thinking the other day, what was the last thing I saw before lockdown and this was it? So I went along to Pitch Houses Central in London and it was it was a, it was really quiet. There was hardly anybody there because it was I think 3 or 4 days before the the general lockdown was going to be imposed. In fact, I think it might have been the Thursday before the lockdown came in on the Saturday night, believe it or not. So we got invited to that and really enjoyed the film and just sort of not really thinking much of it. I said to Tom, "Look, you know, I really enjoyed the film and if there was any chance of an interview with Peter Bogdanovich, then we'd be, you know, would be interested in doing an episode around that. And he said, oh yeah, I know, okay, we'll get we'll get back to you. And then um, had a couple of other exchanges and didn't really think much more of it. And then when lockdown eased and maybe about a month ago, or I got another email saying, are you still interested? Because I think I can set this up. And I said, uh, well, yeah, we are. <laughs> we are still interested. And uh, yeah, it just, just kind of came together from there. And again, after you and I, Neil, had done the uh, the Mark Cousins thing together, I thought it would it would be nice if the two of us were interviewing kind of as a team and we checked that out. Because I mean, it's it's interesting that dynamic rather than just the one-to-one. And I think it actually worked worked well, as you'll hear on the recording. But we do talk to Peter exclusively about The Great Buster and about Buster Keaton, but I think just for the two of us, I mean, to me, Peter Bogdanovich is one of the few people left who has a genuine link to old Hollywood. And, you know, just to have that chance to to speak to someone with that background and that history. And we were really happy to speak about the film. It wasn't a case of, oh, you know, we want to sort of have a shoot the breeze about Orson Welles because he's done that a million times. It was just it was just really wonderful to to really focus on this film, but to hear hear what he had to say. Yeah, just an amazing opportunity to yeah spend time, like you say, in the company of of someone who is so much a part of Hollywood history, both as a filmmaker and also as a conduit as well, you know, in the film, he is casting himself as the conduit to to Buster Keaton and you're in the company of someone with so much knowledge and experience and familiarity. Uh, and that's, that's a lot of what he did, you know, he kind of sits aside, you know, I remember reading Easy Riders, Raging Bulls and, yeah. you know, as a young person and, 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 and sort of seeing him part of that crowd, but certainly not a part of it, you know, and kind of happy to spend more time with those older generation filmmakers like John Ford and Howard Hawks and and obviously Orson Welles and always had an interesting place in that and uh but still central with with those films that he made particularly in the early 70s that he sort of became so renowned for and yeah I think we may have um we may have uh surprised people I think with our with our kind of enthusiasm and kind of repetition of it but it was just just incredible really to 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 have that opportunity and yeah, and just to hear that voice, you know, like it's a very famous voice if you're a cinephile. Yeah. In terms of listening to someone talk about film, and just a real honour to, to yeah, to to ask him some questions and and hear his stories. Where is your starting point with with Bogdanovich? Because I remember seeing the last picture show at, at university, and and just sort of again, it was one of those films where you you're kind of like, wow, this is sort of completely different to stuff I've seen before, and like thinking to myself. You know who is this guy, and then and then you you get um, a sense of somebody who is steeped in kind of steeped in the tradition of Hollywood, but also has that sort of ma- maverick element to him, and perhaps again somebody who maybe suffered because of the the studio system and all of these things that you know a lot of a lot of the the most well known fil- filmmakers in Hollywood history have have kind of talked about or been subject to. Yeah, I came I came to him the same way at the same time, I think. I think, you know, it would have been around my university um, experiencing the last picture show and then that kind of, that triptych, uh, Paper Moon and What's Up Doc, yeah. which are just this is astounding kind of run of three movies, uh, which I think we'll talk a little bit about later on. But but yeah, just 
really interesting filmmaker to watch at a time when also watching kind of filmmakers like Coppola and, and Scorsese and a lot of them are interested in the past particularly Coppola and, and, and the Godfather films you know kind of minding the past but feeling very contemporary and Bogdanovich certainly felt like a filmmaker doing similar things you know that there's nothing old-fashioned about Last Picture Show which is a beautiful film about nostalgia but kind of speaks as much to the 70s as it does to the 50s and never kind of filmmaker whose career kind of followed after that that kind of point until until more recently touching back in with stuff but certainly kind of just admired the the craft and yeah just the confidence you know just the assuredness of those those films kind of just kind of blew me away seeing them yeah definitely the that triptych that you're talking about it sort of sits right in the center doesn't it of the the new hollywood project and interestingly you know maybe again somebody who is maybe not not well not identified with the movie movie brats in that in that sense but definitely a kind of touchstone for them in terms of taking stuff that was great but also trying to move away from the the hollywood has as it became bloated in the sort of 60s and i, I think bogdanovich was seen as a touchstone back to to hawks and houston and and, yeah. and these kinds of people and um, he says doesn't he in the interview that he, he, you know, he like, he's interested in the past yeah. you know and as even though What's Up Doc is a contemporary film, it's it's very much relies on an understanding of of old Hollywood genre, particularly the screwball, sure. um, in order for it to work. Yeah, so yeah, just hope people enjoy this uh, episode. Yeah, yeah, you sort of said before, but th- massive thanks to Tom Finney for helping set this up. Yeah, and, and also you know not to forget that this is a film about Buster Keaton, and we'll definitely t- talk about Buster Keaton a lot more at the the end of the interview. But this is myself and Neil, the cinematologist, talking to Peter Bogdanovich. So we are delighted to be here with Peter Bogdanovich. Thanks so much, Peter, for coming on the Cinematologist podcast. My pleasure. Congratulations on The Great Buster. Me and Neil both absolutely loved it. It's a wonderful testament to a, to a cinematic icon. And we were just wondering to start off with, was this a project on Keaton that was something that you had been in your mind for a long time? No, I never, I never really thought about it. Uh, what, what happened was Charles Cohen, who, who, whose company uh, has basically controls the rights to all the Keaton films, um, he called me up. And he said, uh, "We'd like to do a, we'd like you to do a documentary on Buster Keaton. Are, are you interested?" And I said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, okay, sure." And that was it. It was very quick. And I said, "Sure, I, I love Buster Keaton. Always wished I." He, there were two people I wish I'd met in my life. I met everybody else, but there's two people I wish I'd met: Buster Keaton and Noel Coward. <laughs> yeah, they would have been two people definitely that <laughs> would be worth meeting, to say the least. I was just wondering how how much. Yeah. Was silent cinema informative of, of your early years as a filmmaker and a cinephile? I mean, me and Neil both teach students now, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find a student who would say that the silent era was influencing them. But was it a big thing for you as you were sort of getting into the movies? Well, my father, who was about 20 years older than my mother, so when sound arrived to movies, my father was 30 years, 30 years old. So he grew up literally with silent pictures. And uh, so when, when I was qu- quite young, I think I was about five or six years old, my father took me by the hand and took me to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and, and we saw silent movies. Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd, sure. all, the great, all the great comedians of that era, uh, I saw when I was about five or six years old. So it, it affected me deeply, of course. All visual is all so. The, the movies are essentially are about the, the, what you see, and uh, it's moving pictures. And the most pure, purest form of that was the silent, silent movies because there wasn't anything to distract you from the from the image. There's there's a long running kind of historical debate, kind of Keaton versus Chaplin, and you've obviously made a film with Chaplin uh, as a character, the Cat's Meow. Uh, but I wonder if this is you planting your flag uh, as kind of Team Keaton. Do you, do you have a side in, in that fight or? Well, I mean, Chaplin is this, Chaplin is one thing and Keaton's another. I, I think this, this, there's really no comparison except that Keaton's funnier. <laughs> he was born to be a, 
a silent movie comedian because his face, his non-expressive face expressed so much. Well, Buster had those big eyes, though. Anyway, great legs, too. He had that blank face that you could sort of paint your feelings onto. The great stone face. They called him that, the great stone face, but it was far from accurate. Buster's face had a great variety of expressions. His eyes alone told many emotions. He just didn't ever smile. He's got a mime's face. It's like Jean-Louis Barreau in Les Enfants du Paradis, that beautiful white face. Buster had that face. It just struck me in this way that this man could do all of these things without saying a word and without moving his face, and you knew exactly what the story was. Acting is in the eyes, not the face. It just shows you how little you have to do sometimes to sell something. You don't try to sell it. Just be natural. Buster Keaton always had that quiet tragedy, which is very, very funny. It's such a strange thing to watch the Fatty Arbuckle ones while, where he's still making big facial expressions and, and doing all the sort of tropes of the era. When you see that start to fade away, it was just effortless. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting sort of, you know, talking about the sort of greats of the silent era. And it's often if you, you know, listen to historians of filmmakers, they'll talk about what certain filmmakers have added to the language of cinema. So someone like D.W. Griffith, Griffiths, we might talk about narrative continuity and Wells, you know, lots of stuff, deep focus, as you know, and all that kind of stuff. Would you say that Keaton has a similar such contribution to, to kind of filmic language in that way? He sets up comedy routines brilliantly, and he he's photographed, he puts the camera in the right place for all that stuff. Uh, he was much more visually adept than Chaplin. Chaplin was was brilliant to watch, brilliant, brilliant I mean, comedian, brilliant actor, but he didn't. It wasn't very interesting in terms of his 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 uh, camera work. Somebody said to him. Your, your films are not very, visually not very interesting, Mr. 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 Chaplin. He said, he said, they don't have to be, I'm interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that what you're talking about there, you, it's almost kind of like a choreography uh, mapped onto production design. And of course, the, the, the script in inverted commas, I mean, we'll come on to the way that, that he wrote. And it definitely demonstrates a, a sophistication of, cinematic time and space. Do you think that's something that filmmakers today perhaps have lost? Maybe it's a lost art and going back to Keaton kind of reminds you of that? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Most pictures today are, in a way, are pictures of people talking. Uh, there was this brilliant, some brilliant action stuff, but uh, the kind of warm intimacy that movies, that silent films evoked, uh, it just doesn't exist anymore. Interestingly enough, if you look at the, the great directors of the talking era, like Ford or Hawks, or uh, any of the great directors of the, of the talking era, their, their most interesting sequences in their films are often the, the silent sequences. Yeah, and the, the, there's kind of, it's, interestingly today, there's a sort of reliance, isn't there, on, on uh, the technical sophistication of the of, of the equipment as much as the brilliance in terms of conceiving uh, space and how you're going to shoot, I suppose. Well, it's a different, it's a totally different medium, really. Uh, I, I, it's hard to explain, but the, the great sequences, the silent sequences that there are in so many films that were made in the, that, that extraordinary 28 years, amazing 28 years or so, which really set up the entire me medium. It really, it really, Mary Pickford, I think, said, looking at the evolution of movies, as an art form, you'd think that the talkies came came first, sure. Because because the, the 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 visual the silent in cinema was so much more sophisticated visually. Yeah, no, absolutely. And some of those sequences, um, it was really interesting to in in the documentary to learn uh, so much about the background in vaudeville with his family. You know, and it reminded me of obviously the Marx Brothers were a kind of family vaudeville outfit as well um and to see you know just some of the just be kind of gobsmacked by some of the stuff that he was doing in that um in that family performance from such a young age and i wondered how important you felt 
the vaudeville tradition was in establishing what screen comedy would come to be known for in terms of all those greats that sort of came out of that tradition. Well, yeah, it was a big influence, of course, on, on Buster and uh, from, a very, from a very young age. I can't imagine it was too healthy for him, but <laughs> but he, 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 he managed to survive. You've been drawn to this this period of, of American history and and filmmaking before, obviously, I mentioned the Cat's Meow, uh, Long Last Love, um, Paper Moon. You know the sort of the nineteen twenties and the nineteen thirties, uh, American history and and Hollywood history. Why why is this period so important to you, and 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 why does it still resonate culturally? Do you think? Well, I I think I'm very drawn to the past, so to speak. So I like to deal with things that have happened, and uh, to sort of bring them back to life in a way. Uh, we did we did that with Nickelodeon to try to make, make a movie about the silent, silent era. <laughs> it was screwed, the picture was screwed up by the, the studio, but we have the director's cut available now, so that's good. Uh, but I don't know; it just happened. I, I like that period. It's, it's, I like it. it's the beginning of things, you know. It's the beginning of everything. In the movie, you you characterize the relationship that Keaton has with Fatty Arbuckle who was clearly an, an important influence on Keaton and has, you know, has got a, a particular place in, in movie history. But maybe because of that, we don't see the the legacy of Arbuckle as a director, but also as a sort of important industry person. I mean, it seems to be a mentoring role in direction, but he seemed happy to bring Keaton along in the business side as well. Was that a sort of brotherly relationship or a fatherly relationship? How would you characterize that? I, I think brotherly, I think, yeah. Uh, they, they got they got along, and they were both actors. You know, they got they got along together. And Fatty had a lot of influence on him uh, in terms of how to, how to make a film. And um, it, it, it's tragic. The Buster's last twenty years was so sad that I didn't want to end the movie with that. So I looked for a way to somehow get back to the features, the, the great films that he made in the twenties. And I figured it out when, at the end. Luckily. The uh, Venice Film Festival, I think, I think it was, uh, gave him a tribute. Gave him a tribute about a few months before he died, and they showed all those features, of course, and uh, and it was very well attended. Attended by audiences, and it was a real tribute to Buster, and he was very moved by it. And the fact that it happened just short, shortly before he died, about a few months before he died. Uh, gave me the, gave me the valid excuse to put it at the, put put that whole section at the end. And I, I, I wanted to go out. I wanted to go out, you know, with him being victorious. I didn't want to go out, out with him being a, 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 a sad drunk. So I, I, I cheated there and went <laughs> out out of the or, out of the biographical order, and found an excuse dramatically to go back to the silent, the the, the great features. You know, I I found that really yeah, kind of a fantastic way of approaching the story because so many. So many documentaries take a, a kind of chronological approach, and the result is that, yeah, it, it kind of ends sadly. Um, right. And you, in that structure, you you almost not forget, but you're kind of taken away from what made them so special and worthy of a film in the first place. So, yeah, could you just talk a little bit more about when that came to you to kind of think actually, you know, this ending with this golden period going into the Venice tribute uh, sort of came to you? Uh, I don't know. I just I, I, pretty early on, I decided to end. The- the picture with the, uh, with the with the great silent silent features, you know, and uh, I don't know. I, I that was an idea I had quite early on, and it it, it, wor- it worked. I thought it, wor- it worked for me, and it sort of inspired inspired me to to do it because I, I knew I had this great ending because the great stuff was done in the in the twenties. You know? Yeah, part of that last section is uh, you is a film that you introduced me to, which was the Rail Rodder, this amazing short that he made in Canada, which I watched yesterday and is absolutely stunning. And he, he reminds me of Tati in it, um, the colour film and a lot of the composition. But, you know, he's making this film in Canada with the freedom he hasn't had in years. And then Venice are, are kind of giving him this amazing tribute and incredible standing ovations. And I guess the question is, why why is America and Hollywood so bad at honouring and, and kind of remembering its own stars? Why 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 is it the, the other places that, that give that, that affection? America itself is not a great producer of great uh, retrospectives of the past, you know. We're, America is a kind of a constantly, what's new, what's new, what's new, what's new. 
And, uh, you know, what's new is not always interesting. <laughs> Did you write the script with a sense of how it was going to look in terms of the clips in the, in your head that you wanted to use? Or did you have a, a visual edit in front of you and you wrote the script kind of in parallel as you went along? What was the sort of process of putting it together? Um, you know, I don't remember really. <laughs> I, 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 know, I, know, I, I know that I wrote the, wrote the narration um, early on uh, because it was, a, it was a way of telling the story, you know. Um, so I, I, I don't remember. I, I know that I decided to do it myself, to narrate it myself, which is kind of an interesting, interesting decision. Um, it's, it's, it surprised me that I hadn't done that before. Terry, uh, Terry uh, for Ray Bo, the, the guy who runs the Cannes Film Festival, said to me that it was uh, that the fact that I narrated it myself made the made the film even more personal. Uh, and it was personal to begin with, but it became it became all the more personal because I was actually narr narrating it myself which I had never done before. And how was that for you? I mean, it, it's interesting because I think you really have an in, inflection in your voice in a subtle way that, that, you know, you can tell when you're kind of humoured by something or you're, you know, you're moved by something. What, what was it like sort of doing a, a kind of voice performance on, on the film? I, it was, I, I liked doing it. It was fun. And uh, I felt emotionally very connected to Buster. Neil, did you have a, 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 um, a question on the, on the clips and... Yeah, is that um, is that why you wanted to play so many of them out? You know, it's interesting to hear you talk about that because parts of it almost feel like a, a kind of video essay, where you're kind of playing out the the sequences um, and then sort of you know deconstructing them and analysing them over the top. Um, and uh, you know, why was it important for you to kind of to take that approach so that you know a lot of that that great material is kind of seen in its in its fullness? Well, I mean, that was the point. The point of the movie was to say. Buster Keaton was a genius and, a great, and, a, and an amazing performer, and uh, his movies still hold up after 50 or 60 or how many years it's been. The pictures are worth watching still, and that's, that's, a, great, that's a great achievement. Yeah, and you also kind of pull out these great moments from what might be termed lesser films, you know, so you're sort of pulling out things from Battling Butler and things like that and, and sort of reminding people that, you know, we seem to, critics... Criticism nowadays seems a lot about totality, like the whole film has to be amazing or it's kind of not worth watching. But your film kind of is a return to early film criticism, which often looked at, you know, pulling out the, the good things about things and saying, actually, this sequence alone is worth is worth going to, you know. So was it fun to kind of go in and say, you know, this sequence from this film and, and this sequence from that film are, are, are kind of worth the time of, of kind of investing in? Well, I, I, I discovered so many things myself. I mean, for example, I, I had never seen Butler, Battling Butler, and it's very, very funny. The, the, the fight sequence is, is to die for. It's brilliantly funny. And uh, the rest of the movie is not great, but it's, it's, it's good. It, it holds up. But the, 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 that, that fight sequence is hysterically funny. But I learned a lot about Keaton's talent by watching those, early, those, those extraordinary 10 features he made. Amazing work there. Obviously, the, the sort of central focus, I know a lot of it is his comedy and, and the setup of his comedy and the way his, his, his mind works. And you have some great behind the scenes footage, particularly of, of some of his later work, where he's kind of arguing about where, how the gag is set up. But I think, you know, allied to that, maybe just as important is, the, is his physicality in terms of the action. I mean, you could sort of characterize him as, you know, one of the... the the first action star, maybe, you know, and he had all this training in, in childhood. I don't know if you want to call it training. It would probably be called something else in this day and age. But still today, we're mesmerized by actors doing their own stunts. You think of when Tom Cruise does something and it's all over the press about he, how he's done his own stunts. So I wondered what, what, what you think his he thought of his role in terms of his physicality. And, and do you think that that was just something he came naturally or because he'd, he'd grown up doing it, he thought he, he should be doing, and whether the action and the comedy for him were kind of intertwined? Well, I think so, yeah. Um, I mean, he was he had such extraordinary ability to move. His movements are funny, and, and, and the fact that he could do those kind of falls, backward and fall, falling, it's amazing what he did. Yeah. Some of those falls, you say, Jesus Christ. 
<laughs> How did he do that? There's one where he pirouettes on his head. And he kind of almost does a headstand and he pirouettes. It's amazing. Uh, I think that's from Steamboat Bill Jr. By the way, interesting, interestingly enough, I think I said, I said this in the film, um, the film, his, his, final, his silent films kept getting funnier and funnier. The last couple are maybe the funniest, uh, like a Steamboat Bill Jr. and, uh, and um, College. Sure. Uh, but the later, the last few films are really the, the funniest. He kept getting better. And again, it was the, the sense of timing allied to the space within the shots, and then the fact that he was he was able to to pull them off physically himself. And I love that quote that you have in the film, where he he, he liked to think the he liked to make the audience think that he was outguessed, and then double cross them at the end, yeah, which is actually you know a very sophisticated way of understanding what the audience reaction is going to be. He was impeccable with that. He knew exactly what the reaction was going to be. And he, 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 was, he, was, he, was, he was, let's face it, he was a genius. <laughs> Simple as that. Sure. He, wasn't, he wasn't very sophisticated. He wasn't that much of a thinker. He was just instinctively brilliant. And he never really lost those instincts. I mean, that, the Railrodder documentary shows that he's, his understanding of a gag is, is as good then as it, was, as it ever was. And the film gets into the problems with MGM. And it's kind of amazing that MGM ruined so many great comedians' careers and, and kind of lives. You know, what, what do you think it was about them that, that, that didn't let those, uh, those acts kind of just do what they wanted, considering that's presumably well, why they wanted them in the first place? Well, that's the problem. Um, MGM was particularly restrictive because everything was planned down to the, down to the last second, you know, everything. And they didn't, want, they didn't like improvisation on the movies they, they wanted the script finished and written and or, organized it and so that they didn't run into actors overdoing things or taking too long and so on so it, it was very structured but the trouble is people like keaton needed to be free free to say okay let's do this oh that's that's, that's funny let's do that that's tomorrow you know and uh that's where the the, the the features are so fresh that he made because he was able to just say okay let's do this i've had that myself in my own films i've where i've been able to just say okay let's let's not do that scene i don't like it let's do this instead or something in other words the fact that you you're making it and you're making the film and you're changing things because you thought of something better and uh, in with metro they, they just wanted everything figured out and no changes don't change it because if you change it it's taking it much more time and so on mm. You, can't, you have to be free with comedy. You have to be able to say, oh, that's, that's funny. That's, that's That accident that happened, that's funny. Let's use that. In just in terms of the, the golden era, era, obviously, there's there's this sense that he is, you know, there's always this trade-off between art and commerciality, which I suppose every major star has to deal with. But then as you go into his later career, I mean, it's very easy and sometimes cliche to say that, you know, somebody who, who got to the peak that, that Keaton did, then it's inevitable that you see the the rest of his career as a career as a kind of decline. But I think it's nice that you don't you don't sort of go down that route. And when it comes to his, you know, doing commercials or industrial films or even Candid Camera, which you have a great scene from that, um, oh. you seem to pitch it in a pragmatic sense that th there was some great stuff even in these sort of different contexts. Well, yeah, I wanted to be fair, and I wanted to show that his, his talent didn't go away. Um, it's just that he didn't know how to handle the the, the, the studio system. Um, it just it just ate him up, ate him up, you know. It's, 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 it took away his his freedom. It was very sad. Do you think that his his kind of persona as as an actor was? Again, this is something that, that is often um, talked about in terms of Chaplin, in terms of how he, he reflected or encapsulated kind of 20th century modernity or what was happening in, in America at, at the time. Uh, do, you do you see any of that in, in, uh, in Keaton? Particularly, you say in the film he was obsessed with machines and he seemed to have this, with his moniker, the great stone face, he seemed to have this sort of persona of a stoic acceptance of circumstances that were going on around him. Do you see him as a, as a kind of modernist figure in that sense? Oh, very much so, yeah. He was, a, he was, a, he was not an intellectual. He was all intellect, it was all uh, instinctive. instinctive. And he, he just knew how to people make people laugh. He knew it was funny. 
he knew he understood that the timing was everything and um he, he wasn't uh you know a, a, an intellectual or, a, or a, a, like a well-read person you know he sure. was, was in it was a comedy comedy was an instinct for him he, he just was born to to do that yeah it's interesting how you know you look at filmmakers of the past they think it's much more isn't it for them about the the craft of filmmaking and the 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 wider context or meaning in that sense maybe is is left to others uh maybe sort of uh keaton falls into that category but i think it was interesting how he 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 wasn't scared of kind of playing around with what you know high-mindedly we might call brechtian techniques this sort of breaking of the fourth wall and playing with the mechanics of cinema and i suppose that you know again that's part of his genius that he was able to sort of understand that where the laughter and where the kind of wonder was for the audience in terms of revealing the mechanics of of the cinematic process yeah he was he was he was extraordinary that way he uh he took you backstage so to speak and yet it was very kind of modern you know for keaton cinema was important it wasn't the camera nailed to the floor or nailed to the moving truck it was jokes that worked because of the movie camera it was cinema itself that became the joke I think a lot of my daring in terms of breaking the fourth wall came from Keaton, who, when Sherlock Jr. pointed out that it's a movie, and I'm always pointing out somewhere in my films that we're making a movie. Like when I did Spaceballs. Um, he did it. Buster's always been with me and always will be with me. Our stunts always play in the wide. There's no fudging. The guy doing the stunt is doing it for real, and he felt very strongly about that, and I feel very strongly about that. I stole as many moves as I could from him. Buster said, you hit the ground with your hand as you're going down, and it absorbs some of the impact, and it works. The influence that he had on me was that he could do all these insane stunts and do these crazy things with his body but at the same time he was never like pushing it in the performance such control of his body such agility he was like a ballet dancer incredible control of his body amazing stunts really i think like nobody ever would dare he has no fear or he's crazy He's really doing what you see, which is true in almost all of his films. What you see is what you get. And to me, the best special effect in those films is Buster. I think Keaton was the most modern of the comedians of that period. And he does, that was the point of making the film, actually, to show that, to show that modernity, how he fits with the modern audience. Yeah, and, it's uh, interesting. Uh, very interesting, yeah. Yeah, because a film like The General is is a really expansive film in terms of the, the story and the construction, you know, and there is a difference between his features and like, you know, the, the two reelers, which are kind of, you know, kind of gag fests, um, very much kind of, you know, sketch, uh, sketch driven plots. But but something like The General feels kind of out of time with a lot of the, the films that are that are being released then in terms of its scope and its scale. Yeah, and it's kind of much complexity. of a so much more modern, you know, yeah. actually. A film like the General is very modern uh, in its attitude and, and, and the way it's, the story is told. There's another film of his that blew me away that I hadn't, hadn't seen before, Our Hospitality, mm -hmm. which I think, was, I think was his first feature. It's an amazing film, and very, very funny. And the, the, the central section has to deal with the, the part that somebody's going to shoot him. And he, and he's going to get gets killed. That, and that's pretty funny to, to be able to make that funny. It's kind of amazing. And he's, he's, he's making films which are cinematically as kind of interesting and complex as stuff that's going on in Europe at the time, particularly kind of, you know, like Germany and Russia. Do you think that's why, particularly the generalist, is, was misunderstood on release? Did it feel like people weren't really sure what, what this film was because they were expecting it just to be kind of gag after gag? And there's so much more going on than that. Well, yeah. I mean, he's getting, he's asking you to laugh at people getting killed. And it's, it's, about, as, it's about as daring as you can get. That, that sequence when he, 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 people get, keep getting shot around him, it's, it's dark, 
and it's, it's very, very funny. He, he got away with a lot. Films like The General and Steamboat Bill are kind of still very famous and the kind of the touchstones of of Keaton. But obviously doing a project like this, you're you're coming into contact with the whole body of work. So what are the films that you think are most deserving of reappraisal that you hope that people will kind of be drawn to after this film is, is sort of seen? Because in the UK, there's been a lovely box set uh, of The Navigator, Seven Chances and Battling Butler released. So I think some of those other films are are getting their due now. Which which are the ones that you hope people really navigate towards? All the, the ten features, all of them, all of them are good. They all need to be they all need to be saved, saved and savored. Starting with the first one, what was the, what was the first feature? Oh, maybe the our first, hospitality yeah. was the first. That's the, the first straight feature, yeah. And it's extraordinarily extraordinarily funny, and it's very dark. It's all about a feud, for God's sake, about mm. people getting killed, and and it's funny. <laughs> He was outrageous that way. He could take a dark subject like that, as he did with the general. The Civil War wasn't funny, but he made it funny, and it showed the absurdity of it all. Sure. He, showed, he showed the absurdity of people getting killed for what? Yeah, and it got, it got, that links again to what you're saying about the, the, the modernist element as well, I suppose, where... You yeah, know, very it, much so, very yeah. much so. That, that's one of the things that makes, strikingly makes him very modern. With that in mind, do you think films such as this one where a filmmaker like yourself puts such work into some kind of context is the main way that silent movies and icons like Keaton can be seen in the future. You know, th there will be retrospectives, obviously, of Keaton in certain contexts. But apart from that, it's th this is the way that the, that this this kind of icon will be seen in the future. Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that, that that's I think that's true of any kind of art. art. It's part of its own age. Part of its time, but if it's good, it transcends the, the period in which it was made. Sure. And Buster, Buster definitely transcends that period. What would you say would be the the major influence on your own filmmaking in terms of Keaton? I mean, I don't know if the, if you had sort of direct uh, links to films that you that you have made, or or was it just kind of like more of a a sensibility when you're dealing with comedy or certain situations? Well, I remember when we made um, we made Was of Dark. I said I, I said I said okay, we're going to do a Buster Keaton chase. I, I, I referred to the chase in, in What's Up Dark, which is about twelve minutes, uh, to Keaton because I, he was brilliant at, ch at chases, and I wasn't brilliant at it. But I, I kept saying we're doing a Buster Keaton chase, <laughs> and it, it was it, that was sort of the most, the closest I ever came to something that was clearly influenced by Keaton. When you when you're making that, which is you know sort of early seventies, is that a reference that that people knew and they understood what you you know what was what was the kind of the cast and crew's understanding of Keaton when you were making the films b back then? I don't think they knew what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but I showed it's, them a couple of films. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting, isn't it, that you you have got in in the film a lot of uh, interviewees, you know, big names. Quentin Tarantino and Bill Hader, the comedian, and Dick Van Dyke, obviously, who was a sort of direct, directly influenced. Were those guys people that 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 were well known as sort of Keaton fans or aficionados, and and you knew that that was going to be placed in in the film, or did those sort of clips come and were edited in, you know, in and through your your voiceover? Well, I did all the interviews before I cut cut together one one thing. I, I said the difference between a feature. A fictional, fiction feature, and a documentary, is that in a, with a fiction film, you shoot the script, you shoot the film, and then you edit it. With a documentary, you do, you do all the interviews first, and then then you then you start to cut yeah. because because you don't know what you have until you've done them all. You don't know what you're going to get from the interviews, so you can't really start cutting until you know what you got. Yeah, and you don't know what you got till you finish doing the interview. <laughs> what were some of the things that came out of those interviews that that sort of struck you in terms of things you really wanted to focus on in the film? Because obviously, there's a lot of people who knew uh, Eleanor uh, talking about sort of Buster as a person. Well, I think um, uh, that was the most interesting to me was the, the, per, the, per, the personal stuff. But somebody like uh, Werner Herzog, who I think is very funny because he talks about how funny tragedy was. 
<laughs> he's real, real, a real European intellectual talking about <laughs> talking about Buster. I thought it was rather quite quite quite, quite funny, actually. It, it, when he says the tragedy is very funny or something like that, it's, it's very perverse. As soon as he as soon as he came on it, it and he started talking, it kind of made sense. You know, there's that very kind of well stone faced sardonic kind of immovable kind of presence that he has. I was like, oh yeah, of course Herzog would be a Keaton fan. You know, he's, they've got a very similar kind of presence. I think that's very still and kind of stares at you. Uh, almost kind of looking through you, I think. It's really interesting to see him there. Yeah, it, it was, I thought it was interesting too. I mean, this is probably a silly question, um, but uh, I was thinking about your performance in The Sopranos um, and the fact that, you know, so much of what you do in that show is kind of listening and reacting. And I wondered, you know, like, did you ever conceive of it as kind of playing silent and, and, and using face and kind of minute gesture? Because so much of that is successful because you're you're not trying to take up the space. And I wondered if there was any kind of connection between that kind of acting work and uh, and kind of silent cinema for you. Well, uh, it's hard to answer that because I, 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 I try not to be self-conscious when I'm acting and um, just let it happen. I studied acting. The only thing I ever did study in, 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 in show business. Uh, but I just studied for about a year with Stella Adler, who was an amazing teacher. Uh, I don't know if I ever thought of that consciously, that what you just asked me. I, I don't know if I did. Uh, when I'm acting, I go very much on and just let it Just like it. Buster. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a, lot, a lot like Buster. I don't, I don't intellectualize it at all. Well, Peter, thank you so much for taking the time out to speak to us. We, we really, really appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much, Peter. An absolute honor to spend time with you. My pleasure, fellas, and I wish you luck. I mean, your, your hearts are in the right place dealing with Buster Keaton. <laughs> Thanks very much, and take care. Have a good day. Okay. You too. Thank you. And perhaps one of his most well-remembered shorts, Cops, debuts. There are a lot of amazing things about his filmmaking, but more than anything for me, the idea that he'd be in these really heightened comic scenarios played incredibly seriously. such a fun aspect of comedy that heightens not only the humor but also the stakes of every scene that he was playing. That thing in Cops where he grabs that car and flies up, I mean, that's, that's unreal. Even he couldn't explain it. I said, was the film speeded up? He said, no. How he did that was superhuman. There were no tricks. He just did it. That would have jerked anyone else's arm off. So there you have it. That was us and Peter Bogdanovich, uh, a sentence that still doesn't feel real despite saying it a lot and boring people with it in the last week or so. Um, yeah, thanks to him for his time and his generosity. And thanks again to Tom for setting it up. Dario, uh, how are you feeling about it now, sort of a, a week after the fact almost? Yeah, just made up to be able to speak to somebody, you know, that just seems, you know, so far away, really. You know, when you read yeah. about and you watch the, the films at university and you see names, you know, you see these names from 1970s. And look, it, there's no point getting around it. Things are changing, but the, the new Hollywood era is something that is still deified very much in film school and film university. And again, there are problems with that. We understand and things need to, to change. But, you know, when your formative years are spent sort of watching those those films and to talk to somebody who's right in the middle of that is is just is just fantastic. Yeah, it was interesting. Just some of the things he said that, that stuck out for me, like, say, for example, that he always wanted to make a film about Buster Keaton, but this wasn't, you know what I mean? It wasn't sort of a project that had sat there for a while waiting to go. Somebody had came to him and he said, yes. And, you know, let's not forget the guy's 81 years old. So talking about the way that he set up the interviews himself. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, I mean, it's a difficult one to ask. I didn't ask him this, but how much did he think that those guys participated because it was Peter Bogdanovich is an interesting question rather than Buster Keaton, you know? So that would be... Yeah, that would be a, a, an interesting thing to think about. But also, just when he talked a little bit about the, you know, the structure of the film, I think was interesting that that, that he had that that sense of understanding that that there was this period 
that was central to what made Buster Keaton an icon. And that was the thing that he wanted to to focus on. I mean, and in a way, he could he could have made the whole film about craft and and made the bi- biographical elements a lot less. But perhaps that's not going to sell a documentary. I think that would be very sort of inside the bubble when it comes to cinephilia. I just thought it was lovely that he, you know, he talked a little bit about doing the voiceover and didn't really talk about the other voiceovers he's done. You know, on 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 Kill Bill. And other other films that he's 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 narrated, for example. Yeah. And The Simpsons obviously is a voice performance thing, so it was interesting that he didn't feel that 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 was key to what he was doing here, or, or it didn't sort of touch back to the stuff that he'd done before, voice voice wise. But yeah, it's it's one of the things I think in the film that makes the film work is the fact it is his voice, so it's Peter Bogdanovich, but also that particular voice that that lends a certain, you know, a very kind of knowing old school ambiance to the the way that he takes you through Buster Keaton's uh, Buster Keaton's life yeah yeah and i think that the aspect of the life i think is is key you know in terms of it not being like you say a kind of just an essay film about the films you know um and i think that there are you know there are parallels certainly in terms of the the difficulties that that Bogdan- Bogdanovich has had in terms of the phases of his career, you know, he's had a lot of personal uh, difficulties in, in his life as well after a kind of early period of fame and great success. And while that's never touched on, you know, knowing that I think does add an extra weight and kind of creates this this really kind of strong bond between Bogdanovich and Keaton and sort of makes sense in terms of why why he'd be interested in a figure like that and why he'd want, not necessarily, okay, maybe not why he's interested, but certainly why he'd want to ensure that there was a, a portrait of the person as much as there is a portrait of the artist in the film. And I was thinking about, you know, what you sort of said earlier, people said, oh, you know, what did you talk about? And one of the things that I really liked about it was that we talked about Buster Keaton. There was such an interest in him wanting to talk about Buster Keaton and whether he'll ever be interested in talking about Orson Welles again or ever be interested in talking about his films from the early 70s again is, is hard to say, but it felt very nice to to kind of to know that he really wanted to talk, he really wants to talk about Buster Keaton. And mm. that feels quite rare that anybody outside of kind of silent cinema and, and cinephilia wants to really talk about Buster Keaton. And that felt like a, you know, a privilege extends from the film, which is let's spend some real time thinking about this person who is kind of taken for granted or isn't really understood and who, despite being regarded as an absolute kind of titan kind of shone brightly for not a very long period of time um, before having a very, very difficult kind of creative life uh, after that. And and as we sort of said, like there's those flashes of, of later glories are, are kind of welcome in the film. Um, and it's so nice to talk to him about those. Yeah. And uh, I, lo- I loved one of the questions that you asked, and he was very magnanimous about it, or diplomatic perhaps, when you, you asked him about, is he Team Keaton or Team <laughs> Chaplin? And I mean, I was thinking about that myself because... Actually, my connection with silent cinema is definitely with Harold Lloyd more than either of those two, or even perhaps more um, Laurel and Hardy, because they were shown on BBC Two on a Sunday, as I remember. Remember, it was Harold Lloyd and then Ski Sunday. Mm. Uh, that's a little bit of nostalgia for you. <laughs> and and I think that Lloyd, Lloyd and, and Keaton can definitely be bracketed together, and Chaplin could definitely be bracketed more with Laurel and Hardy in my view, in terms of the way that they were silent stars. And, you know, it was more about the sort of personality and what the individual was doing, whereas I think Lloyd and and Keaton, you know, it's, it's that sort of setup of the production design and the stunts and the action and that kind of thing. And the sort of physical, physical not just in the body, but in the body in relationship to what's going on around was just sort of thrilling, I remember. And... Yeah, I mean, it's it it reminds me of that argument that was in you know Bertolucci's The Dreamers, where they're they're arguing who, who who is the greatest. Listen to this, Matthew. Mm. The difference between Keaton and Chaplin is the difference between prose and poetry, between the aristocrat and the tramp, between eccentricity and mysticism, between man as a machine and man as a. That's good. Except for me, there's no comparison. Why? Is Chaplin's incomparable? No. Because Keaton is incomparable. Keaton? 
think Keaton's greater than Shatner? Absolutely, I do. Oh, you're on stage. Of course I am. Oh, you're crazy. Come on, Teo, in the first place, you can't deny that Keaton's funnier than Chaplin. Yes, I can. You don't think that Keaton is funnier than Chaplin? I don't think anyone's funnier than Chaplin. Keaton is! Even when he's not doing anything, he's funny. And he looks like Godot. Keaton is a real filmmaker. Chaplin, all he cares about is his own performance, his, his own ego. It's bullshit. That's not bullshit. Yes, it is. Uh, Something I think you Americans understand fuck all about your own culture. Uh, no wonder you've never got the point of Jerry Lewis. Oh, uh, don't even get me started on Jerry. Lewis. I think, you know, I mean, I don't know what what was your answer to your own question there, Neil? Um, why well, I, I err on the side of uh, why can't we have both? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, but because, yeah, it's kind of Beatles or Stones question, I think. Is, of course you it know, is. And it kind of it's, it marks you down in terms of your tribe. But for me, Chaplin, it was Chaplin first. You yeah. know, I watched more Chaplin first. So by the time when I kind of saw Keaton when I was younger, I was like, okay, this is fine, but you know, never really appreciate it because, you know, like I was so kind of in awe of Chaplin's presence and sure. his construction of story and, and that I didn't give Keaton enough respect. But but latterly, I can see the just the, the sheer sort of genius of it. And But I think it was a bit unfair to sort of talk about Chaplin in terms of not staging stuff. I just think yeah, he no, was, I agree. you know, I agree. but certainly it's it doesn't feel as central to the the appeal or the process you know in the way that it is for keaton um you know there's, there's almost a kind of much more emotive uh heart beating at the in chaplin for me in terms of what he wants to get across to the audience um that, that feels very just feels very different you know i think as i've sort of seen more and more of both it's yeah it's hard to it's it's hard to know because it's clear they're doing different things as opposed to just being two kind of silent comedians. And to be fair, I haven't seen enough Lloyd to to know, really. Right. Um, I think I've only seen a couple of things. And, yeah, another reminder of actually, yeah, that is that is a kind of blind spot in my Very in my film watching. Interesting listening to to um, Peter on, uh, on various subjects, particularly w- w- related, I think, to his sense of the importance of silent cinema in sort of understanding the language of cinema, you know, and there's the, I think that there are things that I would, from, from my perspective would disagree with in terms of that whole argument about silent cinema being pure because it's image only and there's no sound because actually, you know, if you look back, there was sound in different forms when people went to the cinema because they weren't watching at home clearly back in the day. Mm. And that whole argument, how sound defines image is, you know, is something that came a lot, later in terms of analysis, I think, in understanding the structure of the cinematic. But it's fascinating, I think, to sort of talk to somebody who has that, who is steeped in that sort of sense of there is a pure, a pure notion of the image mm. that is that is fundamentally cinematic. I don't know what you made of that. Yeah, no, I think so. And I think that I think it's a reminder of of how a lot of the discourse around sound has shifted away from dialogue. Yes. You know, um, which is still seen as a very as the kind of defining point of "Quote unquote sound cinema," and a reminder, yeah, that you know that he he was someone who was thinking about this stuff, you know, a long time ago, mm. um, uh, and obviously, like all of us, has has those formative ideas, things which are, which are just kind of ingrained from from what you study and and how you kind of come across this stuff in the first place. But again, just yeah, fascinating to hear his his kind of reasoning for it and how he kind of perceives it, which I think is is largely how still how a lot of people would see that as well. Mm. Would you show a a silent feature uh, on on your course? I mean, I'm just thinking whether it would be feasible to sort of show the general. I mean, in the current context, it'd be perhaps even more difficult. But you know, the idea of bringing you all in to watch, you know, a 1926 silent movie by Buster Keaton because you know you need to see this stuff to understand the legacy of cinema, or is it? You know, is it a very specific type of course, like a film history, film film theory, much more weighted towards that type of course that would still be able to show show the general? Well, I would. I think you should. I mean, you know, I wish I showed features. You know, and I think what was interesting was your question about the Tom Cruise thing and this mm. idea of an action star. And yeah, you know, I think that so much of what is visible in Keaton on a film production course is planning. Yeah. You know, and that's what we teach all the time, like plan and prepare and have it all laid out in terms of what you want to try and achieve. And, you know, so that you can even if you're just responding to that, but to watch it 
unfold in real time you know and one of my favorite sequences is the 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 hurricane sequence in steamboat bill jr for that very reason just to see how you have to construct everything down to the to kind of the smallest detail um and just what's possible by planning you know and thinking rather than you know just thinking that it's all in in the genius head of the people who kind of rock up to a place and kind of magic is going to unfold you know mm. watching silent cinema is on a practical level as, as well as just being kind of wonderful cinema mm. is that does remind you of of the the necessity and this is idea that technological advancements have made have meant that that stuff isn't possible but i would imagine the same amount of planning goes into a tom cruise stunt <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. you know because it has to <laughs> yeah, you know because because you cannot leave an inch to chance you know like it, it it's the same depth and stuff you know so i think realizing that, that it's not it's not something that that went out with sound you know technology it's it's part of the process if you want to make action cinema and you want set pieces this is what's involved and that's been and he was a pioneer of that i think mm. in a way that no one you know that the others weren't necessarily because the sheer scale of what he was doing mm. as a physical actor moving through space uninterrupted is just it's kind of insane yeah. really i guess i guess it's not really the planning that is different. I mean, there's probably more planning, and when you think of health, health and safety, there's probably you know a billion oh, God, times yeah. more planning. But it's, yeah. I think it's just that sense that with what was available to Keaton, the ability to work out how to get that the shot. Mm. Whereas maybe today there's that you know you'll have fifty cameras all trained on a moment, so you'll get it in so many different ways. You know what I mean? That, yeah. I, I suppose that is the. The smarts, I think, when you when you think of the the pioneering effect of uh, of Keaton as somebody who who sort of builds action yeah. and action action comedy together, you know, is uh, is is so good. And there's that great. There's, I mean, it's Chaplin, but there's a great Chaplin sequence which has got some really nice material on. Uh, I think it's from the Gold Rush movie where he's kind of like he's roller skating or he's like on on wheels and yeah. he's about to tumble down into the you know and they, and they show you how it's done and obviously it's just matte painting perspective. You know, and he's nowhere near. But you know, it's a the, the magic of film craft and how you can kind of piece together the illusion that you're doing all this stuff, and you know, in a very safe way that comes from using your imagination and and the limitations that they had in silent cinema were kind of unknown in the sense that there was no way that they knew to solve a lot of this stuff that they could just draw on. So they had to figure it out from there. And now we benefit from that. Uh, that kind of experimenting but so much of it has been lost to oh we can just do it in cgi we can just we'll do it we'll fix it in post you know and, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you can tell the difference between someone working their way through a landscape that's been prepared for that chase or that stunt and 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 when it's been done on a computer i think it's very very straightforwardly uh visible yeah there is definitely a, a lack of weight let's say that still handicaps maybe the experience in terms of uh action cinema when it's overly overly cgi and when and when actually you know sometimes the cgi works really well but when it doesn't you it really takes you out doesn't it and also when yeah when the rest of the film is set up as a kind of realistic you know rooted in a realism particularly an aesthetic and then the computer effects doesn't just can't match up with with that that's 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 often when it's uh there's a kind of disjointedness between the two things it was interesting to hear him talk about uh, the the inspiration of Keaton on What's Up Doc, which we both rewatched after the interview. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so, so much fun, that, that film. <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious because it's just, I don't know what you felt, but to me, it didn't like, it just started. It wasn't like any... Any kind of, it was almost like you joining it in the, in the middle of a load of action that was going on, you know what I mean? Yeah. It didn't have a sort of definite beginning to me. Yeah, it's just it's like yeah, we're off. Yeah. yeah, kind of like like a starting pistol. Yeah. Um, from the from the first moment, and yeah, and you you kind of feel like you're catching up with something because everyone just sort of enters the film with such energy. Um, it's kind of extraordinarily written, I think. It's funny because I think Ryan O'Neill and his characterization in that film, let's say, I think is is taking something from the the silent era. And again, I don't think he's modelled it up particularly on on Keaton or anything like that. But the other thing he reminded me of his performance was um, was Christopher Reeve doing Clark Kent. Yeah, nice. yeah. <laughs> which is uh, yeah, it was, I, I 
it would have been it would have been earlier than that, wouldn't it? Um, What's up, Doc? When was that? When was that? That's made? early seventies. Yeah, it's yeah, early seventies. Yeah. So I wonder if Reeve had, had watched that and thought, oh, "I'm going to borrow a little bit of that." <laughs> but then, you know, amazing how uh, we've watched Barbara Streisand movies before and covered her on the podcast. But you know, what a presence she she still is. Sort of making the the comedy work in many ways, just with her with her sort of charisma. Yeah, she's hilarious, like um, an absolute star. Which is interesting, yeah, because I think that it feels like a choice from Ryan O'Neill to really sort of downplay and almost like droopy dog yeah. kind of sad sack <laughs> um, character. Um, but the, 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 the pairing between the two is just, it's just absolutely fantastic. Hi. It's all settled. Eunice is going to get dressed and meet us there. I really think it's going to work. Sure, what can go wrong? Please, don't you say that. You just tell Mr. Larrabee that Eunice is really Eunice and the Eunice he thinks is Eunice isn't Eunice. Right. And what will you say? About what? About yourself. I'll oh, just say I'm a girl you picked up in a drugstore. No, no, you don't say that. You don't say anything. Right. I don't say anything. I just sit there and nod. Yes. And then this whole terrible episode will be over. What about us? And us, we'll say goodbye. It's that simple, I think. Okay. You go get a taxi. I'll be out in a minute. And I've forgotten that, you know, it's written by Buck Henry and Newman and Benton. So you've got the, you've got the writers of The Graduate and Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. Kind of, and it's so obvious that you've got these great, great writers because everything is so tightly wound and you're kind of racing towards the end thing. And how is this going to, how are these, you know, yeah. how's it all going to lace? And I've seen it before and it still feels like absolutely kind of on the, on a knife edge in terms of the, the, the plotting and um, how it's all going to be resolved. It's absolutely fantastic. And that chase sequence is just, it's just great, isn't it? Wonderful. Yeah. Because he references, obviously, in the interview and saying, you know, there's sort of a direct correlation. He was trying to do a sort of Keaton-esque chase sequence. And funny, he said, you know, even back in the 70s, he says, well, <laughs> did you reference, you, you asked him, did you reference Keaton? And, and he said, yeah, but nobody knew what I was talking about. So it's, yeah. it's interesting how that sort of, uh, you know, the legacy of Silent is, is still patchy, you yeah. could say, and, you know, and it, I, I suppose how you get to it is one of the reasons why this film has been made, really. I mean, obviously that there is the commercial sort of drivers behind it, but that sense of here is the great back catalogue of one of the, the icons of cinema. How do we put that back on screen? And, you know, it seems an obvious, an obvious one, you know, if, if Peter would do it and then... You know, he clearly wanted to do it, and and I think he's right in saying that this is the way that that these kind of these kinds of stars, these silent era stars, will be preserved going forward. Yeah, I think it's 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 part of an important ongoing project, <laughs> which is the the preservation mm. of cinema um, and and the remembrance of cinema. Um, beyond just a kind of narrow cinephilic thing, I think you know that so much of Keaton was doing, which kind of you and, and him sort of references, is, is is there's a modernity to him, you know, that these are these are not just great movies. These are cultural artefacts from a period of time, you know, which is a, a period of real historical importance for so many reasons, not just artistically. And while you could say, yes, that Buster Keaton is, is already very famous, very famous within within that is not necessarily very, very famous. Yeah. And also, we're very fortunate that, that much of what he made is available in the way that for so much silent cinema, it's not. It's still lost. And I always think that the conversation about silent cinema and early cinema, not necessarily just silent, but early cinema, keeps it in conversation for people who are clearing out lofts and clearing out houses and, you know, and thinking, oh, well, wonder what this is. You know, and it happened. I saw it online the other week, you know, some, someone had been gifted a a piece of eight mil, eight millimeter kind of film, which had kind of previously lost scene uh, or sequence from a film. And it's just like, this stuff is, it's, it's still out there, you know, that, that while it's still a real thing, it, it, the chance to to discover more of it is important. But I think you, it has to be in people's minds. And, you know, the work of like Pamela Hutchison and, you know, increasingly kind of festivals like Cinema Retrovato and Cine Rediscovered are kind of just keeping keeping it in the conversation and saying that there's this this stuff is stuff matters and it's out there so that we more of it can be found and also trying to expand Keaton's understanding of Keaton beyond the general and steamboat bill junior to amazing sequences and amazing things in 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 kind of lesser known films which is where a lot of the boutique labels are coming in by kind of trying to get this stuff out with the same reverence as that yeah. as those kind of canonical masterpieces 
Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's definitely the case, and and you know, it's it's just a really enjoyable film to watch in in any kind of frame of mind. And you know, we think we we talked a little bit at the beginning of the podcast about what have we been doing, what have we been watching, and I think you know, this kind of film is something that that takes on a sort of I don't know what I don't know what the right word is, not a poignancy, but a sort of sense of here is a history that that is is worth spending time with. You know, I don't want to make a sort of correlation to the the, the way that everybody's feeling right now, but it, but it's just kind of that that sense of I think everybody's sort of searching for a place to go, you know, mentally at certain times. It was just really nice to be to be in the in the theatre for for this film and then watch it again at home and just just lovely to talk to Peter about it. Absolutely, yeah, well said. Uh, and for those of you who are in London and back venturing out to the cinema you can see it on the big screen again and uh pamela hutchinson uh kind of former guest on the podcast will be doing a q a on tuesday the 29th at the genesis cinema in east london and uh, we'll put a link to those tickets on the website as well yep so we definitely recommend getting along to see that if you can uh neil really enjoyed that been a great first episode yep Good to be back and what a way to kick things off. Feeling good about the new season. And just a word to you listeners out there who continue to support us. We really appreciate it. You know, get in touch on all the usual channels. If you enjoyed this episode and want to want to talk a little bit more about Keaton, then please do. You can get the links to our Twitter Twitter handles uh, on the on the webpage and on the Podbean site. Obviously, you can email us at cinematologists at gmail.com. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can always become a Patreon subscriber. We've been recording videos here and there in the summer. And obviously, we have our monthly newsletter that always goes out with a little bit of a, I don't know, a reflection on on the world and everything. And then a host of recommendations from both uh, Neil and I. And thanks again to Gweno for the amazing new theme tune. Uh, We absolutely love it. Uh, and hope you do too. Gwenno's going to be on the show, hopefully in the next few episodes, talking about the making of that piece of music. And yeah, we're going to play it uninterrupted as our outro for this week's episode. And following hot on the heels of our first episode of season 12, where the next episode is coming out pretty quickly. And that is going to be a round table or a, or a round Zoom discussion um, of... Film Education in 2020, and that is with the um, educators and researchers Freya Billington and Catherine Wheatley. So we all get into the weeds about what film education is going to be like in 2020 and what it what it's going to be like going forward. I think it's going to be a really important and valuable conversation, I think, uh, for for those studying and teaching film uh, in the in the next few months. So, yeah, looking forward to getting that out into the world as well. But for now, that'll be it. Uh, we're back. Thank you for joining us as ever. And we will catch you again next time on the Cinematologist podcast. Thanks for listening.